The Ohio Supreme Court is known as the court of last resort because it's the final stop on appeals from the lower courts in Ohio's 88 counties. Six justices and a chief justice make decisions that affect every Ohioan. Now, three of the seven seats are up for election this fall. In one race, Judge Sharon Kennedy, a Republican, is going up against Justice Yvette McGee Brown, the only Democrat on the court. Judge Kennedy began her justice career as a Hamilton City police officer. She's been a special counsel for the Ohio Attorney General's Office, magistrate in Butler County's area courts, and is serving her third term as a Butler County domestic relations judge. There's been a lot of discussion lately about judges legislating from the bench, effectively rewriting the laws that the legislature has previously written. How do you feel about that issue? Tony, thank you for the question. I believe that judges must hold their limited form of government as outlined in the Constitution and uphold the law, not rewrite it or legislate from the bench. It is only then that Ohioans are guaranteed that the law is stable and predictable. During the campaign, voters will be asking you a lot of questions about specific issues. How will you answer these questions so that voters will have the information they need when they go to vote? without violating the Judicial Ethics Code. Thank you for your question and good luck to you this year at UC. I think that there are many forms of questions people can ask without us violating the canons and giving an answer. One is background information. Uh, where were you born, raised? What have you done professionally within the service of the justice system? For myself, when I am asked those questions, I served as a police officer in the city of Hamilton for four years before I went to law school. When I attended University of Cincinnati College of Law, I actually clerked for a general division judge and actually wrote uh, and did research on um, summary judgment motions, motions to dismiss on all arrays of civil litigation, and then had a little family practice, hung up a shingle and practice domestic relations, probate, juvenile and criminal law, and appellate work within that. And for 14 years, I've been a trial bench judge in the Court of Common Pleas, Domestic Relations Division in Butler County. And from that experience, I think they can see in my 27 years of service that I have the broad-based um, legal perspective needed to sit at Ohio's highest court. And sometimes they ask very pointed questions about my service that can then actually help them make those decisions as it comes to election time. Many people feel that justice is for sale in Ohio due to the uh, influence of campaign contributions to Supreme Court justices. How can you assure all Ohioans that your decisions will be fair and unbiased in light of the fact that you're accepting money from interest groups that expect you to vote their way? I think that the current canons and the makeup of um, the way we have structured judicial races helps to insulate and actually support people in understanding that justice is not for sale in the state of Ohio. Um, currently, judicial candidates have to create a finance team that then they go out and raise money. Um, there are limitations on what people can contribute, whether that is an individual or a PAC organization. And in that, it is not um, the free-for-all in some of the other states. And I think because of those restrictions, people, Ohioans, can be assured justice is not for sale in the state of Ohio. When it comes to sentencing, which do you prefer, judicial discretion or minimum mandatory sentencing? I think that sentencing has taken on a new approach over the last 15 years where the state legislatures have stepped in and created mandatory minimum guidelines in sentencing. As a result of financial woes within Ohio and as a result of overcrowding in prisons, it is their way to address what is happening um, across the state. I respect judicial discretion because it is there in discretion that judges can try to find the correct solution or sentence for an individual offender. And it is only through that that we perhaps do some rehabilitation of low-level nonviolent offenders. As a Supreme Court Justice, what would you do to ensure that people in poverty, people that are underrepresented, or people that are otherwise disenfranchised have equal access to our justice system? I think there are two ways to ensure that. 
One is the new state form situation which is being created where the Supreme Court has created um, statewide forms that allow people to access domestic relations and juvenile courts. In the use of those forms, and then the forms that the courts themselves have provided allow them to write out their complaints and what they want the court to address to give them a forum into the justice system. Similarly, that's happening in the county courts and municipal courts when it comes to civil wrongdoing. Equal to that, I think, is the representation of the indigent um, in criminal settings having worked as a private practitioner who served the needs of indigents in the criminal justice system, there is always, or are always, um, lawyers willing to serve in that capacity to help those indigent individuals obtain representation through the criminal courts. There seems to be a philosophical difference of viewpoint on the court about the punishment of juvenile offenders. In your opinion, should juveniles be treated differently from adults in all cases? Do you believe there are some punishments that are just too harsh for juvenile offenders? I think that all judges are guided and required to follow the law as it relates to sentencing. And the sentencing structure is created by the legislature. Like adults, I think that juveniles have the ability to rehabilitate and in doing that you look at those factors in their lives and what can be worked on through a probationary track or even if you're doing rehabilitation setting or a delinquency setting in a detention facility with them probation in the community and helping them to address those struggles or hurdles. Um, unfortunately, crime is an equal opportunity employer and we have seen juveniles um, create or actually engage in some of the most heinous crimes. And it is up to the legislature to create those sentencing structures that judges are required to follow when it comes to sentencing serious juvenile offenders. Ohio currently elects its judges, but many people feel they should be appointed by the governor or a nonpartisan committee. What do you feel is better for the community and why? Since 1850, our Ohio Constitution has granted the electors the right to elect and vote for their judges. I embrace the transparency that this public process creates, creating a smaller group in which to make those selections has transparency issues. While I would agree that there are other options available um, on these statewide races, which seem to be um, some of them um, get the greatest amount of criticism. Um, because of the politics and the nature of running, I think there are other options to look for. We currently elect House of Representatives and Senators by way of districts. I think that would be a viable option because you're still allowing the voters to select who will sit at all the court systems in Ohio. We still have a foreclosure crisis in Ohio. It's been five years since the Supreme Court took the initiative to encourage attorneys across the state to represent homeowners in foreclosure cases and also to set up mediation programs in the counties. What will you do to review how that process has worked and to strengthen it going forward? I think that in looking at the work of those lawyers engaging on a pro bono basis um, can actually be strengthened by the new rule that the Supreme Court is currently looking at. And that is giving lawyers who serve indigents um, credit on continuing legal education for the number of hours that they are serving pro bono. So for 36 hours, they get six hours credit on continuing legal education. As the next justice of the Ohio Supreme Court, I would examine that program and then see if there's a way to ensure that the lawyers who are actually engaging and helping these families make sure they get the credit they deserve. The office of the Ohio Supreme Court is a highly influential position. I'd like to know three things about justices who are running for the Supreme Court. Number one, what has been your greatest accomplishment in administering justice? Number two, what has been your opponent's greatest accomplishment in administering justice? And number three, what has been the Ohio Supreme Court's greatest accomplishment in administering justice? Well, thank you for the question. I think my greatest accomplishment in administering justice is twofold. One, working with state legislators to change the jurisdictional limits in Butler County to allow families that are separating but married to file custody actions in our court instead of litigating those in juvenile court. 
where then they would be forced to litigate in two court systems at one time if they ever terminated the marriage. And secondly, is running a small specialized docket within my court, trying to find the answers of the barriers to those um, employment opportunities for individuals who have child support obligations and working with other stakeholders, the Department of Jobs and Family Services, in facilitating that program. Um, for my opponent, as she was a former juvenile court justice or judge in Franklin County, and she actually did some innovative things with juveniles in the sentencing reforms. As for the Ohio Supreme Court, I think their greatest accomplishment has been in the specialized dockets, particularly in the mental health dockets and the substance abuse dockets, SAMI courts for the dual diagnosis, and then also this new endeavor in veterans courts. If you're elected as justice, will you make your decisions based on your political affiliation or what you feel is best for the people of Ohio? I would make my decisions based on the law. Judges are fair and impartial individuals and their personal beliefs and opinions do not have a role within uh, a decision. Political affiliation is also eroded from the process. As you get to the general ballot, you will notice that there are no R's and D's behind the names of the judges. And it is done intentionally so that the political process does not impact the choice of the voters and or the decisions that courts make. Judges are required under the Ohio Constitution and under the Constitution of the United States of America to fairly and impartially apply the law as written, not rewrite it or legislate from the bench. Thank you for your question. As voters across Ohio who take to the polls on November 6, I would ask for your vote and support. For 27 years of service, a former police officer, a law clerk and director of a victim witness program, a general practitioner serving the community's needs, one family at a time, and 14 years as a trial court bench. I believe that 27 years of service in the justice system demonstrates my commitment to the law. As judges, we are limited in what we should do. It doesn't matter about our personal beliefs or our personal opinions. It doesn't matter our party affiliations. What matters is the law as written. My commitment to you and all Ohioans is to honor my commitment to the law, to uphold it, not rewrite it or legislate from the bench. If you plan on voting in person November 6th, to make sure you know the ward number and the precinct number of where you should cast your ballot. Tom McKee, 9 News at the Ohio Supreme Court in Columbus.